Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 16, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as can come out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of flesh that is on the earth. We give thanks for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, and for the word of God among us. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, pour out upon us your spirit of wisdom as we hear the words that you have for us today. God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Allie. You know, the, this story, wow, right? Um, when you come back to it as an adult, it, it's pretty amazing. And, um, you know, a lot of questions come up. Uh, how could the whole world be flooded? Well, I think global warning is actually answering that. I mean, God, God promised not to do it again, but we might do it to ourselves the way things are going. Um, and how could all these animals line up, and, and how could these animals fit all the animals of the earth fit on this boat. How can a handful of people then take care of them? But I, I want to offer to you that all of that, though it's fascinating, is a distraction to what the story is really trying to say. Now, if you want those questions answered, uh, there, there's a whole place that somebody's making a lot of money off of that you can go and see people who've tried to answer those questions. But I'm not concerned with those questions. I mean, there's a more powerful question that's being posed and answered for us here. And, and I would say it's more amazing than, than any of those questions that we might ask about the logistics of the flood story. And not only that, there are, there are several things here that happen that we miss because we're focused on the fascinating story that is meant to catch our attention, but then to draw us into conversation about some deeper, more meaningful questions that we should be asking. Uh, and part of those questions is, is, how does God's heart work? And why? Why is there wickedness in the world? You know, if you, I've been in the church long enough that I, I've heard this statement a, a dozen times or more, why doesn't God just come down and end it all and get it over with, right? How many of you have ever said that, you know, after watching the evening news? Um, and, and we wonder at that. Well, guess what? People have wondered about that since people could communicate. And around campfires and pit fires and hearths and mantles, this story has been told probably uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years before it was ever written down that asks that question. If what we see is so wicked around us, why doesn't a good and loving God set it straight? Now, from the kids' perspective, um, when we learn this as children, and, and is there any other, in fact, I can't even really think of another Bible toy other than Noah's Ark, you know? We don't have Samson and the judge's action figures. I don't think we do. Um, that would be cool, though. There's a million-dollar idea for you. It's mine. I'm patenting it. Don't, you know. But, but this one, you know, the little boat. We love the boat and the, the animals. We're drawn to it. Um, but when you read the story as an adult, uh, you realize it wasn't written for kids. 
especially if you follow the story to the end. And for those of you who know, if you want to go look at it and see how uh, Noah's son Ham treats him, it's kind of, you know, it's not meant for kids. And it begins with, you know, God seeing um, the wickedness of man and he, he pledges to wipe out all flesh from the earth. It's just kind of a uncomfortable and that is said like four or five times at the beginning of the story. All flesh shall be wiped off from the face of the world. All flesh I will take away. And it's, it's difficult. You know, we have our mission statement that we have Christ-like unconditional love and acceptance. And it seems like God is violating that here, doesn't it? But they're asking a question. And around those campfires and, and around our Sunday school classrooms and around our living rooms... Um, we're meant to be talking about why when we hear this story. Why does evil persist in this world? Um, The question of this in religious philosophy is called theodicy. And um, it it comes from the Greek meaning vindication of God. How do we vindicate a good and loving God when we see all this awful that is around us. There's arguments about how we make sense of that if God is omniscient, if he is all-powerful, if he is all these things that we believe him to be, then, then why? Why the evil? Why the darkness? And why does a good and loving God um, bring a flood and cause such calamity? This is a, a, a difficult, difficult and challenging story. But on the surface, when we approach it, 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 it begins to look like God can't tolerate wickedness, and so the unrighteous are wiped out by his vengeful hand, and it doesn't sit real well. There, there's another book of the Bible, in fact, a book in and of itself, that is committed to theodicy, and that is the book of Job. Um, If we believe some of uh, our historical textual criticism, Job is probably the oldest uh, written narrative that we have in Scripture. And I find that interesting because Job is all about, if I'm a good person, why can bad things happen to me? And, And if you read through Job, you get an answer. It's a powerful answer, but it's an unsettling one. Essentially, God says, because I said so. How many of you had parents that said that to you? I, I vowed as a young man that I would never tell my children what my parents told me because I said so. You know, um, you can ask them how well I lived up to that. But <laughs> sometimes there just isn't a good, you just, right? And essentially in Job, when Job is, is crying out to God, God says, Did you hang the stars in the sky? Do you know how the behemoth in the deep of the ocean lives and survives? Do you feed the flocks of the field with your hands? He essentially says, in comparison to me, you just can't ask that question. Which is fair, honestly. Um, It's interesting, in uh, current studies, I found this uh, amazing. Um... Of the known universe, we know about, we understand about 5% of it, according to scientists. And there's about 95% of it that's still a mystery to us. In fact, last month, does any, did anybody catch the news? This is such earth-shattering news, but, but nobody really knows about it. Uh, we discovered a fifth force of nature through some studies happening in Chicago in a particle accelerator it will completely change how we understand physics. And we only understand about a fifth of all of it, how it works, how it fits together. There's a lot of deep mysteries out there. And so it's fair for God to just say, it is because it is, because I'm God. That, that's a fair answer, but it's very unsatisfying. And, and the story of Noah and the flood is, is an, another way Another way to approach God's heart and make sense of of the mess that we see around us and asking that question, why doesn't God just just deal with it? One of the amazing things that um, happens here in Noah, it only happens in one other place, and it's 
uh, with, with King Saul. Um, but God repents. Not something we would think to see, but it, we see it twice in Scripture. Um, and, and here we see it in Genesis 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humans on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. The only other place he repents is when he, has, he repents that he set up Paul or Saul as king over his people. But he, he looks down and he sees that everything is such a mess. This good creation that he has made that was tov miod in the beginning, very good, beautiful. And he grieves that he's made humanity because without humanity, everything would be going just fine. And that initiates, that initiates the flood narrative. And I heard one preacher uh, deal with this um, in an interesting way. And I'm going to kind of steal, steal his uh, illustration. And uh, I can do it now because I have a golden retriever. How many have a golden retriever? How many know how affectionate they are? Needy? animals um they just they have to have your attention they love you so much they're a great dog to have i love my golden um and he told this story about his golden retriever and its neediness but this one was like hyper needy i don't know what happened to it um but he and his wife were uh, had a new baby in the house and the dog was somewhat jealous of the new baby um, and when they would hold it, he would kind of jump up on him a little bit um, to, to love the baby, but also to just, you know, get their attention. And it just kept building and building until the dog was just so anxious. It was jumping all over him one day. He was holding his newborn son, and he's kind of like doing this dodge thing. And finally gets the baby in the crib and has to drag the dog into a room and lock him up. And he begins working in his home office while the baby sleeps. And he begins hearing a, like a digging and he realizes on the other side of the wall, his collie has dug a hole through the drywall to try and get to him. Or his collie, his, I have a collie too. Uh, golden retrievers trying to get through. And, and it becomes more and more of an issue. And uh, at times the baby's kind of at risk with this overactive dog. And he and his wife make a difficult decision. And he talked about that the need to, to remove the dog from the home. And how God looked down at humanity and what it was doing in destroying itself and destroying his creation, and it grieved his heart. And he repented of having made them because of the pain that they brought. And so uh, one is seen who is worthy, and that one is Noah. Noah and his family is seen as righteous, and God determines to start anew. And after the floods come and after the floods recede, he, he does something else that should be very interesting to us that we miss when we focus on the, the amazing provision through the ark, that we miss when we start trying to talk about how Noah and his sons picked up the poop. You know, I, I don't know how all that happened. And I'm not really interested in that. But I'm interested in, in what God does here. Now, I know that's probably too small for you guys to read. That's okay. It's just up there mainly for me to read. But if you want to follow, it's in Genesis 8. Um, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. So, you know, we're asking this question, why does God let things go as they are? Here's your answer. Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. So Noah and his righteous family have been brought through the floods, but God still knows this about humanity. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. This is God, again, repenting of the action that has happened. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and this is a message for us, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So the flood narrative is saying, why does God not just come in and wipe out these wicked people? Wipe out this mess, put my person in control of it all, and everything will be all right, which in fact is what Israel was looking for for centuries 
Why doesn't he do that? Because he loves us. If you want to take Noah literally, it's because he's tried it once and he didn't like it. It grieved his heart. It weighed on him. Weighed on him so much that he said, I'll I'll put a sign in the sky that says, I'm not going to do this again. And he makes with Noah a new covenant. A new covenant. Now, one of the things about this new covenant that goes on to explain is that he gives uh, Noah and his family the right to the flesh of animals. Seems like an odd detail, but if you remember uh, with Adam and Eve, what does God give them? All the you know, fruit of the trees and the plants. You can eat that, but don't touch this tree. Do you guys remember that one? Knowledge of good and evil. Don't go there, God says. Uh, that knowledge is reserved for me. And then to Noah, he says, okay, you can have not only, and in fact, as mentioned, you can have not only all, all the fruit of the plants, but you can also eat of the flesh of the animal. But do you know what they can't have? but not the blood. Because that is the source of life. And that is the image in which I have made you. In essence, the source of life is in the blood. And God says, no, you can have all things. Humanity, you can have all things, but not that, because that's mine. That's sacred. And what's happening here is in the garden when Adam and Eve make their bad choice and grasp for what God says, is not, that's not for you. Uh, God slays animals and he provides cloaks for them to cover them up and he concedes a portion of his own righteousness. He tells them, surely you'll die when you eat of that tree. Do they die? Well, not immediately. So God's not a liar, but he concedes, he gives. And then when the wickedness of humanity causes this deep flood, again, he concedes. He says, okay, you can have the flesh as well, but not the blood. John chapter 6, verse 53, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And people leave him in droves. We have a tendency to project ignorance on people of the past. They weren't ignorant. They knew he was talking in metaphor. They knew he didn't mean it literally. But what he said metaphorically upset them. Life belongs to God, not us. Not you, Jesus. How can we take what God has held back from us? So I I, I think a lot of times we get this narrative so wrong. Well, not wrong. We We don't go deep enough with it. We don't realize that within it is a revelation about the heart of God that says, as you keep running from me, I keep running towards you. I keep conceding as much as I can until it comes down to even the source of life. We read it as a story that is about a vengeful God who wipes us out if we misstep. And it's been preached and taught that way, and some churches and denominations in history have made it all about that. But when really the story is about God saying, okay, I'll go a little bit further if you'll just meet me. A little bit further if you'll just meet me. A little bit further if you'll just meet me. It is an expression of the deep love of God. And it's also an answer as to why. Why doesn't he just come and wipe it all out? Because he loves it. He loves you. He loves us. He loved us so much that despite eating from that tree, 
despite wrecking all of creation, which we seem to be doing a pretty good job of right now, um, just as they did back in Noah's day. Maybe even we're doing a better job of it now than they were. Despite all that, he set a table and said, those things I have prohibited, just come and take of it. Just be a part of me. Receive me. And live in response to that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your deep love expressed through the stories of both the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the stories of your Son and his apostles. Let it be revealed to our hearts that deep love. May we come to the table. You have conceded so much. Let us at least take that one step towards you and receive the body and the blood of Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen.